This week on Vice, groundbreaking innovations in managing autism. They're trying to shut down channels because the world is really overwhelming. I just can't see. It really was like somebody had turned off a switch. It was as if he was looking right through me. So in our lifetimes, will a child with autism be able to walk into the hospital and walk out without autistic behaviors? For some of them, I, I believe this is totally possible. Autism spectrum diagnoses have been on a steep rise in recent years. In fact, according to the CDC, one in 68 American children born today has autism in some form. Now, because of this, the scientific community is marshalling major resources to figure out the origins of the condition and how to treat it. Most of these kids don't have an integrated sense of the world. So it's a fractured experience. So you, you wonder why kids walk around with their fingers in their ears or they, they cover their eyes. or It's because they're trying to shut down channels because the world is really overwhelming. If you don't know what the important data is, everything might be important. So a car horn might actually be the thing you have to pay attention to, or the humming of a light bulb might be the thing you have to pay attention to. If you can't figure out what's important, you have to pay attention to everything. guys who is always regulated up here. Everything happens quickly. What he doesn't have a chance to do is really process what he's going to put back out. I can't believe I need to be on the show. <laughs> what would your show be called, Sol? I have no idea. <laughs> what would it be called? I've seen a movie oh. called Coop on the Two Strings. I what? haven't seen that movie. What about Iron Man 3? Oh yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> Did you see that? I did. Did you? Yes. The movie guru. <laughs> I'm not movie guru. Like the expert. Spectrum Disorder, or ASD, has seen a 3,000% increase in diagnoses in the last 30 years. You can't talk about autism as a disease. It's many, many different things, and it's a range within each of those things. We sat down with Dr. Jeremy Veenstra Vanderweel, or Dr. V, a psychiatrist at Columbia University, where he devotes most of his time to pursuing new treatments for autism. Autism Spectrum Disorder captures 
difficulties with social communication and restricted repetitive behaviors that sometimes have the sensory quality that when they are occurring in the same person can be approached with common assessments. Why has there been an increase in identified cases? So we don't completely know. And I mean, that's one of the things about being in science that you have to admit when you don't have complete knowledge. Honestly, I think part of the increase is a real increase. And that may be kids who are surviving neonatal intensive care units mm. who wouldn't have 20, wow. 30 years ago. We know that those kids are at higher risk. It may be things like uh, advanced paternal age, which we know is a risk factor. Um, some of it is a decrease in stigma. So when I first started sitting in with people, families didn't want to hear autism. They wanted to hear anything but autism. Mm. And now because people understand that early intervention can make a substantial difference, families are more willing to hear it and more likely to hear it for that reason. Griffin, good morning. Griffin Giacomo was diagnosed with autism five years ago at the Center for Autism and the Developing Brain, where Dr. V treats children with ASD. Come, let's go. Let's wash up. No? Come on, let's go have some breakfast. That's okay. Look up. Ready? Can you want to do bubbles? No, we're not standing. Okay, lift up. Want to brush your teeth? See the bottom. Yeah. Good job. What's wrong? You know what we can do? We can go outside later. Would you like to go outside? Here's your talker. Okay. What do you want? Oh, great. What would take a typical family 10 minutes, it takes us 45 minutes. You know, and so these kind of things are difficult, but it's getting better. You know, at least now he can put his head through his shirt, which may not seem like a big deal to a typical family, but to an autistic child, it, it's like, you know, trying to have an eight-year-old, seven-year-old do algebra. It's incredibly difficult. Watch this, this is sort of fun. Wanna play ball? the sounds and yeah. all this vibration and he's like in heaven now with that. He's got the sunshine, he's got his ring pop. Yeah. When did you first see signs that something was different about Griffin? For me, it really was like somebody had turned off a switch. I left the house one morning and I came back after work and I went to have an exchange with my child and um, it was as if he was looking right through me. From that point, I really knew that something was not right. Your friend encouraged me to go and have him tested because she had had challenges with her own son, and I took her advice, and I'm, I thank God that I did. The first signs of autism can be terrifying for parents, but they can also vary greatly from one child to the next. Griffin was diagnosed at age two by the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule, or ADOS, which involves therapists observing and scoring different behaviors and sets a numeric threshold for an autism diagnosis. Standardized tests like ADOS have created more reliable and earlier autism diagnoses. Better assessment methods are a key reason for the rise in autism cases. And that rise is pushing the scientific community to develop a whole new set of ways to treat the condition. Angry? Surprised? Sad? Scared. Good. The Autism Glass Project is one effort from the tech sector that builds on Google's technology to teach children with ASD how to perceive basic emotion they often miss in social interactions. Autism Glass uses artificial intelligence to analyze facial expressions and then visually and verbally describes the emotion. Happy. Good. We went to Stanford University to meet its creator, Catalan Boss. What's running behind us is a computer vision system that recognizes emotions. It's based on a face tracker that tracks up to 100 traditional points within your face and then uses a machine learning classifier to predict whether you're happy or sad or something like that. So this is essentially how you developed autism class? Yeah, exactly. I was working on 
you know, emotion recognition and face tracking software. And we realized, hey, this could help people who struggle to identify social cues. You know, we're spending time building software that can teach machines how to recognize emotions. There happen to be people who struggle to identify social cues in people's faces. The GLASS project is focusing on these fundamental emotions that everybody must know, must learn. Kids with autism don't necessarily look to faces. They're not getting those neurons developed, those layers of the onion peeled back so they can proceed into more complex social scenarios on their own. Why was it so important to create a device that parents could take home with them as opposed to use in a therapy session? It creates these opportunities for natural engagements between parent and child, care provider and the child, in ways that we almost didn't initially anticipate. Moms and dads of children with autism are by far the best suited to teach their kids. The changes that I have seen, yeah, night and day differences. Sarah, you're up. Nice. I mean, almost immediately, I would tell her, hey, can you look at me? And she'd look at me. Before short answers, yeah, I'm fine. After she was able to have confidence to speak back without feeling like what she was going to say was wrong. And now she actually will have a conversation with us. Mm -hmm. And that's so priceless. Autism Glass could provide much needed relief to families and several other promising experimental treatments are already well underway in clinical studies. Harvard neurologist Dr. Alvaro Pascual Leone pioneered a technique called transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS. TMS is a way to inject current in the brain without having to do surgery and open up the, the skull. A coil of wire outside the head generates a magnetic field. That magnetic field reaches the brain unimpeded. It makes those cells that are targeted fire uh, in a different way. It can either make them fire more uh, or be suppressed uh, for some period of time. And that allows us to figure out what causal role a given brain area has for a given behavior. So we're going to go into the TMS room here. At Bradley Hospital, Dr. Lindsay Oberman performs a TMS procedure on 16-year-old Evan Thalig, a high school student at the high-functioning end of the autism spectrum. Help us to understand what's going on in your mind in, uh, in a social situation. Like if, every time I ask a question, I like, before like, talking, I ask myself, do I really care about the outcome of this? Like If, if I asked if, someone, if someone's having a good day or not, do I actually care whether they say yes or no? Is it kind of like you overanalyze what could be a very simple question that would Always. start a conversation? It works great with math because you can do only there's like a logical limit to how much you can overanalyze before you already have the answer. But with like English class and uh, I have, you'd have to I would have to. Like the, like the book that we were, like, not book, but like the play we were like looking at was The uh, the Crucible. Have you heard of that? Yeah. Yeah, I was having a uh, hard time reading, like, reading it because well, the per I guess the person who put it in the, ad, in the uh, textbook didn't know the first thing about actual formatting. So they used like a, a stupid serif font. So I couldn't really get over that. I'm gonna adjust this so that it's comfortable for you, all right? I believe you. The brain is influenced by everything we do, by every experience we have, by every thought we have, by every action we take. The concept of plasticity is the idea that the brain intrinsically is changing, is modified by experience. But also because of plasticity, we may develop symptoms of disease. If you have a more plastic brain, well, you should be able to acquire skills quicker, to learn things faster. But if you're influenced too much by the experiences you have, you run into this chain reaction where the brain becomes progressively noisy rather than progressively better structured. The benefits of TMS vary greatly between participants, but it's already shown some extraordinary results. One of Dr. Pasquale Leon's first participants was John Robeson, who credits TMS with changing his life. They were going to do a half-hour stimulation, and the effects would last about half that long. 
And they kept me there another half hour or so to make sure I didn't like just roll over and die after the experiment. And then they let me loose and, and I pulled out onto the highway and I turned on the music. I could hear every individual voice, all the singers and the chorus. I could hear each instrument. I could, I could all see them in my mind moving around the stage. It was like I was transported from the car right into the concert. It was just, uh, just staggering. And it was just so overwhelming, it made me cry all the way home. And I, I wrote the doctors, I said, that's some powerful mojo you guys have in that thing. After a series of TMS sessions, Robeson, like a number of others, was able to gain a cognitive perspective that has greatly broadened his ability to read and recognize emotions. Imagine that you were a colorblind person, and all your life, you listen to people talk about the beautiful blue sky and the pretty red dress and the, and the deep green lawn. And, um, and you saw the world in different shades of gray. And you, you looked at that and you said, this is bullshit, they're just baiting me. And, and imagine you go into a scientist's lab and they do something to you and they turn on color and you walk out and you say, holy shit, this is real. They weren't lying to me. I see that blue sky and I now I see the, the green lawn and, and, and that must be a, a red dress she has and a blue shirt and a, and a yellow shirt and they are beautiful. And then it fades away. But you know what, for the rest of your life, you're gonna know that was real and you're gonna always react differently than the day before it happened. You'll never go back. While emerging therapies are already showing results, many scientists believe that focusing on the underlying biology of the condition will lead to the most transformative treatments. So far, scientists have discovered hundreds of genes implicated in ASD, and researchers are tracking their effects in an unexpected place. We're headed toward Monkey Island, which is just right off the mainland of Puerto Rico. There are over 1,500 monkeys that are roaming freely there. The rhesus monkeys of Cayo Santiago descend from an original colony brought over from India for research in 1938. Today, the world's first wild primate research facility has become a genetics gold mine for scientists studying autism. What we've got here is the kind of variation in behavior that would be very difficult to approximate in any other kind of place. Dr. Michael Platt is a neuroscientist at the University of Pennsylvania. He and his research team study how the genetic makeup of each macaque leads to unique behavioral traits. How do you match genetics to behavior? Each animal is unique in the genes that they possess. We are extracting DNA. Uh, we then decode the genome of these animals. And then at the same time, we are doing intensive behavioral observations. We can decode those genes and we can find those monkeys. We can track, say, the behavior of an animal who's carrying a certain set of genes that we think might be implicated in, in various disorders like autism. We can see whether their behavior is systematically different than other monkeys. Now, we've identified a few of the monkeys who possess variants in a number of genes that the rest of the population does not, and these monkeys tend to not fit in well in societies. Behind us, sitting in this tree, is a female named 42L. She tends to live on the outskirts of groups. She's never really fit in. Uh, she has a daughter who has also uh, had difficulty fitting into groups. And the two of them both share uh, variants in a number of genes that we don't see in the rest of the population. And these genes have been implicated in studies of autism in people. Ultimately, to really test it experimentally, you would have to manipulate that gene and demonstrate that you had an effect on behavior mm. down the line. But now there are efforts to use very, you know, cutting edge techniques to actually genetically alter these animals. Scientists have been modifying genes for some time now, but the technology took a giant leap forward with the advent of CRISPR, which allows them to actually cut and paste genetic information with pinpoint accuracy. At MIT, Dr. Goping Fang is studying one of the more common genes associated with autism, Shang3. Shang3 is a very important gene for developing neuron-neuron connections. If a neuron do not connect properly, the brain cannot function normally. Clinical uh, scientists uh, discovered that deletion of the, this gene is linked directly to autism spectrum disorders. In what ways are you using CRISPR technology today? CRISPR allows you to do um, any kind of genetic mutations 
So we can put the human mutation into that animal model to mimic the human condition. If you put two mice together, normal mice, they will immediately find each other sniffing, cuddling. But if you put two shanks, three mutant mice together, when they're getting close to each other, they will suddenly separate. If we put a toy into the, their cages, normal uh, mice, then they will go play with it. They even go get a top up. Mutant mice, they will suddenly start up. They will never will touch it. They have a very hypersensitivity of their whisker system, which is their, one of their primary uh, sensory organs. Dr. Fang observes how the mice's outward behavior changes and how the gene affects the brain at the cellular level. But he has goals beyond understanding the mechanisms that cause autism. How will this translate to creating treatments for humans? You can imagine uh, people are very excited about the use of CRISPR to correct the mutations. If we know the mutation, now you supply a normal copy of DNA template, then that a normal copy will go in and replace the mutant. Now you correct the mutation. Basically, you permanently correct the problem. That's called a cure. So in our lifetimes, will a child with autism be able to walk into the hospital for gene therapy and walk out without autistic behaviors? For some of them, I, I believe this is totally possible. For many families, a cure for autism is their greatest hope but a growing number of advocates within the autistic community think differently. Autistic rights are human rights. Autistic rights are human rights. These voices call upon the scientific community to recognize neurological differences as part of natural human diversity, not as medical afflictions that must be eradicated. In 2010, NIH spent about $217 million on autism research. Of that, only one and a half percent went towards research on autistic adults and our needs. I believe this is a civil rights issue, and I believe that the United States of America can guarantee the civil rights of all of its citizens. One of those self-advocates is John Robeson. Long before his autism diagnosis and TMS treatment, Robeson had a successful career as an audio engineer. I got to working for uh, Pink Floyd Sound Company, Britannia Row, and um, this is one of the base amps from our system. It's still got the old markings, Pink Floyd Mark III amplifier and rock and roll relics now, anyway. This was, uh, this was me with Kiss. So I built a bunch of stuff for the uh, 1980 Kiss tour. Really every guitar in those years that shot fire, shot rockets, blew up. If it, if it did something wild, we kind of made it. Sometimes people look at me and they think, oh, well, Robeson, he's just a natural born electronic genius or something. But that's not true. What happened was I was rejected by people and I was, I felt, accepted by electronics. And, and I dropped out of school and I spent 10, 12, 15 hours a day studying electronics. And by the time I was 18 years old, that was, you know, thousands and thousands of hours. So the autism was the thing that really hurt me as a boy, but it also gave me my freedom. Now, Robeson owns an auto repair shop for luxury cars, which he uses to run a mechanics school for students with developmental disabilities. All this leather paneling and woodwork and all, all this is gonna come out. We're gonna put racing seats in. It's gonna be completely gutted and bare. It's gonna be a race car inside. And while he credits TMS for giving him the social skills necessary to be a public advocate for the autistic community, he lectures about the benefits of neurodiversity. What is neurodiversity? Neurodiversity is the recognition that there is a range of neurological difference that is a part of humanity. We could take any other population. We could take the Jewish population, the Native American population, the, the white male population, and within that group, we could find some people who were really intellectually challenged and some people who were brilliant geniuses and most people who are somewhere between. Mm -hmm. And autistic people are the same. We have some significant challenges, but we have some significant gifts. And it's time to move beyond the model of autistic people as broken normals mm -hmm. and recognize us as, as what we are. Thanks to this community activity, we have scientists coming out of the closet for us, this is like gay rights in the 60s and 70s. We now have scientists that stand up and say, I'm autistic and I'm proud of it, and I'm gonna help autistic people because of my difference, not in spite of it, 
but because of it. And that so much What advocates like Robeson are asking for is not to wipe autism off the map, but to focus on developing solutions for patients' day-to-day -day needs. Where do you hope autism research goes from here? We need to shift towards delivering benefit to us today. And, and it's great to think that we can head off really profound disability at some far future date. But we have the ability to solve problems right now if we deploy the resources to do it. And that's what I push scientists to do. There are people with autism who can speak for themselves and say what would improve their lives. And I think we need to listen to that. And I think we need to think about ways to help. At the same time, I work with a lot of people who can't say that, who can't speak up for themselves and say what they would like. What we have to do then is to listen to their families and also imagine ourselves in their shoes and what would improve their lives. Ultimately, that at this point means research based in biology, um, trying to understand what's happening that leads to autism risk, what we can do to lead to better outcomes, not just for people who are able to speak for themselves. Ten years ago, we have no clue what caused autism. Now we have many genes to work on. My feeling is that in the next 10 to 15 years, we will have some much better treatment for the drug treatment for control some of the symptoms. It's still a long way, but I think the progress is, is actually incredible.